Hello and welcome to a special edition of the Game Informer show. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by Matt Miller this time. Hello, hello. Matt Miller, what are we doing here today? We are going to talk to Tim Kaine and Leonard Boyarski about The Outer Worlds. The Outer Worlds. Uh, if you don't know those names, you should. You really should. Uh, they go back a long ways in the industry. They created Fallout, for Christ's sake. The original take, the isometric version, all that stuff. Uh, they worked at Troika, Vampire Masquerade, Bloodlines. There's a lot of fans of. We talk a little bit about their history, but the bulk of this is talking about The Outer Worlds, their new project with Obsidian. We pulled dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of questions from the community, uh, stuff that they can answer. There are some good answers in here. Yeah, it's cool. And and the the thing I really like about this conversation is it's an opportunity. We've been rolling out content all throughout the month of looking at The Outer Worlds and looking at the insight that these two gentlemen have, have brought to the game as co-directors. But it's really cool to see them sitting side by side and just kind of having a conversation and getting a sense for this this partnership that was so formative in uh, the North American video game RPG landscape, right? right. I, I mean, it's it's hard to overstate how much that uh, some of their ideas and some of the things that they care about in video games have filtered out to the rest of the gaming development community. And so here they are talking about their new project, and you see the way that they they capitalize on each other's strengths and capabilities and um, and the way that they talk with each other, and you can see that, that partnership really having um, a cool quality to it. Yeah, and what I like about this podcast, which, by the way, this is a special edition. Normally we air new episodes every Thursday talking about other cover story information, exclusive impressions of games, games we're reviewing at the time, other interviews with game developers. If you're into that sort of thing, it's the Game Informer Show. Thank you for tuning into this. But what I like about this podcast in particular is having this level of like development talent, yeah. but then opening it up to the community and saying, what do you guys want to know? And so every month we do this for every cover story. So we're revealing our new cover story next Tuesday. Yeah. So stay tuned to GameInformer.com because we're going to do this whole cycle over again where we'll pull questions from the community, get some talented developers on Skype and ask them. I mean, we always think about that, right? Like we go through and we rack our minds about how to get the most interesting information uh, from the developers that we talk to. But inevitably, there's stuff that we just don't think about or that maybe for any one of us personally isn't the top thing on our mind. And there's different stuff that's important to different players. And so this is our, an opportunity to get those questions that maybe we didn't know were important to a particular subsection of the game's community. For sure. But here they are. And we have so many answers. They have so many answers to share. Uh, at the same time, this video, if, you've, if you're watching this, you probably noticed it's pretty long. So if you want to listen to it while walking around the house or buying groceries, whatever you're doing, you can always subscribe to the audio version of the Game Informer Show podcast. Uh, search that, and this episode will be there too. But without further ado, here's Tim and Leonard. Tim and Leonard, welcome to the Game Informer Show, guys. Hey. Hey. It's an honor to have Hi. you. Hey, thanks for uh, letting us invade your studio a little while ago and release a whole month of coverage here. Uh, no, thank you. It was great. It's been, it's been great coverage. Thank you. Oh, good. Any, anything we've gotten wrong? Any misconceptions? Any comments, complaints, words of wisdom? Tell us all the stuff we got wrong. Please. I don't think there was anything that I yeah. that nothing jumped out at me. It was, all it right. was yeah, flawless. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys give us a couple minutes, we'll go read it over and yeah. look it over. Okay. And find yeah. back with some Fair enough. Are you uh, the type of game developers that read a lot of the comments? Do you watch your own video interviews? Does that drive you insane? Yes. We, we watch them, we read the comments, and then we go and say, <laughs> <laughs> we do talk about why did I say that? Why did you say that? Yeah, because um, you, for, you forget some of the stuff you talk about, and you always open it up with a sense of, or a video with a sense of dread. <laughs> did I say something I wasn't supposed to? Did I say something in a completely, uh, uh, a way that can be completely misinterpreted? <laughs> it's been nice on our end to see so many comments. It's not just one or two. Like, it is all over the place about people just appreciating um, your candor. Yeah. You know, it, what feels like, what feels like honesty, at least. Who really knows what's going on behind the scenes? <laughs> but, but, but no, seriously. We hard. <laughs> like it's hard to I, fake it. I, I think that there's a lot of, a lot of people who do appreciate uh, it, the way you guys have communicated with us about it and, and by extension, the broader community around the game that uh, I think you're being being straight about what the game is and what it isn't. And and I think in the current gaming landscape, that's something that is refreshing for a lot of people. Which is kind of sad. I know. It's it is. Crazy. But it's great. Also, a comment I've seen multiple times, Tim, 
is you open one of the videos uh, by talking about how poorly you've aged compared to Leonard, and there are a lot of people that are like, Tim's looking fine. <laughs> like, there's a, there's a fan base out there for you, sir. Good God. All I see are comments about who Leonard looks like. Like, he looks like Vincent Van Gogh, according to one of your reviews. Oh, I got Nick Offerman, it. too. But I also, I also pointed out that none of them are... Uh, okay, I don't want to say anything bad about Nick Offerman. <laughs> I'll stay away from that comment. All right. No. Uh, I'm curious, what are you guys working on right now for the game? Like, what, what stage are you at compared to maybe a month ago or so when we actually visited the studio? I'm going through all the user interfaces uh, because we're looking at places where there is friction, things that you do a lot of things and, and there are just too many steps to do them in the current interfaces, or interfaces that aren't resonating, or interfaces we've got comments from QA about, hey, I don't get what this is telling me or showing me. Um, and also we're making sure we have enough tutorial pop up at the beginning that people can understand some of our more unusual skills. Yeah. I'm, I'm spending my time uh, reviewing dialogues. We're trying to lock everything down for localization and to go into the studio to start uh, recording VO for the game. So that's uh, it's quite a, with a game like this, it's quite an involved process and lengthy and trying to make sure you don't miss anything is, can get a little stressful at times, but uh, I've also heard them though break into spontaneous laughter though while reading through some of our dialogues. Well, hey, that's good. There I, we go. I can only imagine with a game like yours what preparation for localization must be like. Just <laughs> very it's calm and relaxing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I like to do it on vacation. I uh, you know. Can we say what the what Raptodon got translated into? Oh please. It's, it's, it's like. Shiza Rapta, which <laughs> looks like <laughs> Raptor, <laughs> shit lizard, and we're like, that's okay, a, that's amazing, perfect. That's a good name. Yeah. <laughs> and you guys have a PAX East panel coming up, is that right? Uh, yes, we do. We're we're actually going to mention that if you didn't. <laughs> Please, and we will take it? questions from the audience there as well. Oh, and when's that coming up? What's the date on that? March, March thirtieth. Okay. Saturday. Well, awesome. Not to deprive uh, wonderful packs, but the goal of this podcast is to answer is, all the questions. Yeah, is to make sure that community is just crickets <laughs> for hours for you guys because there's going to be nothing left to ask. So here we that go. Sounds like a Let's fun time. Do it. Absolutely. First questions from Austin Tool saying, What about the game uh, makes a non open world better for it? Why not go open world? What about this game makes for a more contained world more effective? It, I think the I think the uh, setting, or the conceit of the game that you're someone who's you know the space hero who flies from planet to planet or location to location kind of demands it not being an open world, and one of the things we found with the engine is that um, giant big open worlds don't work as well as smaller ones anyway. So it kind of um, ended up being that. Uh, Something that was just kind of dictated by our original concept for the game um, has actually worked out in terms of like how the engine works. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, we wouldn't want to be like, oh, you're a space adventurer. Here's a big giant map the size of like the Mojave wasteland for you to run around in. Um, and you could fly your ship from place to place on the same map. Just doesn't seem to have the same uh, appeal. Yeah, for sure. The uh, I've noticed a lot of comments too of just people thanking you for making... I don't know if you guys put it this way or if we put it this way, but just a more contained RPG, a smaller experience. Like There is a fan base out there that's so appreciative about that, and I'm so happy to see it because it's the way I felt for a couple of years as well. Like the concentrated essence of an RPG? I guess so. Just boil things down. I'm sick of 100-hour open worlds. I don't need every RPG to be that experience, you know? Yeah, there's so much to play now that if you do get a game that says it's 60 or 70 hours, you're like, ugh. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Well, it, once again, it was dictated by you know other things, uh, things outside of our control, um, the budget. But it just feels like you know if we're going to concentrate on a game that we want to have a lot of reactivity and a lot of replayability, giving you guys a 200, 250 hour epic is not conducive to a lot of our fan base replaying it multiple times. So it just it seemed to be the way to go. Yeah, RPG Ghost 1776 uh, is asking if there's going to be multiple maps on each planet. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, not everyone, but it depends. There's there's a couple places that have multiple maps. There's a couple places that are just one single map, like space stations are one map. Yeah. But we have several planets that have yeah. several places that have several maps. Yeah. Uh, Izerok wants to know, since you mentioned dwarf planets and moons being explorable, did you ever use procedural generation, or is everything hand-drawn in this game? It's hand-drawn. Um, we talked about procedural generation super briefly at the beginning and set it aside. 
but they're not it, for this game. It brings it. It brings its own uh, issues and limitations. Uh, the thing it's it, it saves you on some things. It creates ma major headaches on other things. We I use bet. procedural generation in Arcanum, so we kind of know what it would do and not do for us. Yeah. So. Okay. And again, then if we're using that, so we can create so much bigger maps or so much more content we have to, or so much more area square footage, we have to fill that with content. Yeah. It felt like it, just in the broader game development community, there were several years where everybody was jumping on the procedural generation bandwagon before realizing that like, well, sometimes it's good and sometimes eh, maybe not. And I well, think it's like, kind of like VR. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of like VR. In the limited space of time between us getting AI that we could just say, here's the character, react, and then taking over the world completely and becoming our overlords, <laughs> we'll have like really cool RPGs where we can just, you know, have tons of content that's completely reactive because we don't have to write every last line. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, it's interesting thinking of like Mass Effect and Andromeda early in that game's development. They were going that procedural generation world route too, and then just like, ah, let's just scale it back, scale yeah. it back, scale it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you you want to be able to test all your content, too. Yeah, no it doubt. It helps, yeah. No doubt. Uh, Nemo has a question uh, asking, will there be random interactions with companions inside the ship, like joining them for a poker game or just having a cold one? Uh, not as, yes, but not as interactive as sitting down with them and playing a poker game or something like that. Uh, there are events on the ship where they interact with each other or that you can talk to them about different things than you would talk to them normally about on uh, missions. Got it. Uh, Toma asked kind of uh, a related question there. Will our companions talk to each other while you do, uh, while you do whatever around the world? Yes. <laughs> they often make comments um, on what you do or especially what you say in dialogues. Yeah. Um, sometimes there's back and forth between them. There's um, mostly it's them interjecting into a conversation with a with another um, NPC. But when you're running around like out in the open world, sometimes they'll start bantering back and forth. And there's, uh, of course, the ship events that we talked about. And the most important question as a follow up, do the NPCs talk to each other when the player isn't around like on the other side of the galaxy? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. They and do. thankfully, we don't have to write all that dialogue. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Not there, they just go there completely are a silent. There instances where um, your ship's computer makes reference to them doing things when you're not around that are, that are pretty funny. Oh, that's a fun idea. Uh, Brady Lavelle asks, how many companions will there be on, at launch? Is that something you can share? Um, I don't think we want to share the, the full number. We know, we know, obviously. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I know we haven't talked about my favorite. Yeah, we're mm. we're we're keeping we're holding that one back. For the oh, audio we're listener, a couple back. Okay, for the audio listeners, they're holding up their fingers, and it's a very specific number. <laughs> and as everybody knows, the number is. <laughs> uh, Brady followed up, uh, also asking, "Is the player able to change what weapons and armor the companion can equip?" Yes, um, you can. They have their own inventory. You can put different armor on them. Uh, you can give them different weapons. Um, in fact, I dressed up. <laughs> I dressed up one of our companions differently, and then forgot I had done it and was shooting her because <laughs> I didn't recognize her because she has a helmet on. So we're also putting an option in so you can maybe see them without the helmet. Yeah, uh, they do have their special attacks that we've shown off that we showed you guys when you were here. Um, those use a weapon that you can't unequip from them. I don't even know if you can see it in their inventory. Yeah. So they'll always have that weapon for their special attacks. Um, but that's, you know, their special attacks are a very unique one-off thing. Every other, all the rest of the game, you can equip them however you want. Yeah. Do you, uh, I, I know that the, uh, uh, one of the examples that you talked to us about, about related to companions and what they've got equipped is related to the shrink ray that we got to look at, right? That the idea that that's going to act as a, a thing that uh, makes it easier to do damage to, a, to an enemy, but you you need somebody to do that damage if you're holding the shrink ray, right? And so yeah. there's choices you have to make about like, do you hold the shrink ray or does your companion use it? And that kind of thing. Well, what's cool is not any can the companions use that, but they use the same roles. So if you have a companion with a better science skill than you, oh, cool. you should probably give them the shrink ray. Yeah. Because it'll shrink the monsters even more. That's cool. Um, Puchinski asks, uh, will the characters creepily stare at you unblinkingly while delivering their lines? 
<laughs> uh, I guess that's a matter of uh, sub subjective opinion. Um, if you look at the videos, if you look at the videos we've uh, we've you know the ones that we've uh, you guys played the uh, the B roll and even the stuff we've released on our own, um, that's pretty much what it's going to look like. Uh, there's going to be a varying degree of like hand uh, crafted animations. Um, for like some of your major events, there'll be a lot more care put into those, but we have an automatic system where they randomly do things and blink and look different directions. Um, but obviously we can't hand animate every conversation in the game. Why yeah. Leonard answered that, I stared at him creepily and I'm blinking. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Malcolm wants to know, hey, just two quick questions here. Is there a level cap? Yes. Okay, and what is that number? <laughs> 30. 30. Also, is there a crafting system? Yes and no. There's no crafting per se, but we allow you to mod your weapons and armor and tinker them to become higher levels using parts that you can find around the world. Okay. Uh, Barkley Bowers says, are there any survival aspects, etc., or like you need to eat food, drink water? Yeah, in, the, in our supernova difficulty mode, you have to eat, drink, and sleep. And if you don't, there are meters on your character page that measure your hunger, thirst, and exhaustion. And if they get too high, your character will start suffering from uh, penalties. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, Kinzu says, hey, can we turn off quest markers and also be able to get where the locations are by depending on NPC description or obtain notes, uh, just like in Bloodlines in the original Fallout? Um. I don't know if we do. Currently, we don't have a setting to turn them off, but it's easy to not show them now that we have them. Yeah, one of the goals early on, or one of my goals early on, was to be able to do that. Um, and we've tried to make it so it's fairly obvious, but with a, with a 3D world, it's not always easy. And then there's, the, then there's the case of, you know, we have to lock things down for localization, and sometimes things change afterwards. Um, but... Yeah, so I, we'd probably have to have people play it and see if it how how it's bad it was. Yeah. The I mean, yeah. th it'd be nice. I mean, I would like to do it conceptually. It's it, philosophically, I think it's a great idea. This person's follow-up question is about the the markers over enemies' heads. So I suspect that he or she is coming at this from a perspective of they really like that kind of clean UI experience Immersive, of yeah. just like being in an alien world and not having a bunch of stuff over you know marking their marking up their screen. So just in the HUD, yeah, like yeah. just not a lot of markers in there. I'm sure we can turn them off. We just don't have settings for that yet. Sure. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, I did, how would how would that work if you turned off like their health bars? Maybe I guess shoot them <laughs> until they fell over and die. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, that's that's real hardcore. You don't know how how close they are to death. That's fine. That's just Monster Hunter, man. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. What, what's the harm of just ter having that option, even if the game is maybe extremely difficult to get around without those types of markers? Like, is it is there a downside for just throwing that in there? Nope. You know, the only thing, reason I can think we wouldn't do that if we don't have time to add that setting. I'll put it down on the list. Because I know we're, we're talking about adding other settings for, like, some people didn't like seeing that if there was a dialogue line that they couldn't say, that it yeah, was grayed out. Totally. So we're just putting a setting and saying it's the, just The screen. only downside to it is if it's not a good experience. I mean, I, we might put it in there anyways, even if we don't think it's a good experience. But... You know, we, we want people to have a great time, and if we feel it makes it, you know, virtually unplayable, then that would might be an instance where we decided not to do it. But yeah, or we might just have a major, like, giant red red letter warnings. Uh, our, turn our, this off. We're not responsible <laughs> for your gameplay experience. Yeah, us. right. Our our reader Kinzu is going to be so over the moon excited if he gets this game eventually, and that's that's. <laughs> how so. it is <laughs> yeah. because he will know that he oh, made yeah. it happen don't let down uh, AJ Extreme <laughs> wants to know are there going to be vehicles that you can drive in the game no other than your ship yeah, and but you, you don't, don't drive it yeah <laughs> so exactly uh, Ryan Morgan wants to know are there any mechanics of gravity such as weightlessness and stronger weaker gravity environments no All right. was, we had those they were cut Sad. Yeah, it's a great idea. We'd love to explore it, but it was time and budget. Time, time, and budget. budget. Yeah. time and budget. Smo we need a sign that just says time and budget. <laughs> <laughs> like Bugs Bunny used to hold up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Smokane91 is wondering, just in general, how reactive will NPCs be? Will they react to what you're wearing, what type of day or what time of day it is, how many times you visited them, etc.? Um, pretty much the standard you would expect from from the games we've made in the past. I think that um 
we've tried to include a lot of that in terms of you know what you're wearing. Um, not as much time of day. Uh, one of the things we've done with time of day is um, there is time of day because it, it creates nice atmosphere. Um, we don't have things depending on time of day. We don't have people change where they are if it's at night or during the day so that you have to find them because that introduces you know a whole new set of of, of uh, you know conditionals and okay you have to be able to if you talk to them in this location it's different from talking to a different location and this is where i would hi hold up my sign of time and budget yeah yeah fair <laughs> Plus, enough we, we played games and i won't say who, what they are where the NBC goes i have something important to do and then he goes and lies down in bed like, <laughs> thanks dude uh tommy law is very curious about stuff around gear management particularly he asks, can you tell us how inventory works? Uh, are there weight limits or space limits? Will NPCs drop everything they are using or wearing like they do in a Fallout game? Um, first of all, we're, yeah, it's not going to be WYSIWYG, which is what you see is what you get. Um, so they don't necessarily drop everything you see them using. Um, there's no uh, carry limit per se, but there is an encumbrance limit So based on your strength. So once you hit that, your character can't run or fast travel, but you can keep picking up more and more and more. We don't, there's no upper limit to what you can carry. Is, uh, well, uh, Maiko Selva asked, are items in the game hand placed or is there some kind of random loot system? There's both, um, which is driving our economy guy insane. <laughs> we have lots of hand placed items um, and we have characters even that we've decided I want this particular character using this particular weapon. Um, and then there's also um, a lot of stuff that's just generated. So we have loot tables and hand place loot. Cameron Banks uh, has a pretty broad question here. Can we expect a bunch of cool loot? Hmm. Yes. <laughs> Took the words right out of my mouth. Can you, can, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and extend Cameron's question a little bit and ask, uh, can you give us a couple of examples of maybe your favorites of things that you might be chasing? Um. Well, if you're talking about like really useful, I mean, in addition Just to the science like. weapons, there's a lot of really cool weapons in the game that have been augmented in a way that you wouldn't be able to do with our modding system. But you can still mod them once you get them, so you can make some really cool, unique weapons that you modded. Um, and then in addition, we have so many really cool, if you're talking about just fun, in terms of funny, we have lots of cool products. Uh, which is, by the way, one of the reasons we dropped the crafting system other than time and budget was it didn't make as much sense in a world full of full of branded consumable items. And we have tons of branded consumable items that are fun to pick up and eat and drink and throw at people. <laughs> uh, the excellently named Scud Electric Boogaloo mm. asks, uh, do outfits work like Fallout where you can equip for the head and body? Are you able to equip multiple head items like hats and glasses and things like that? There's a body item and a head item. Um, there's only one head slot, but we do have different head things. So we do have glasses, goggles, bigger helmets, really big helmets. I, we said we had the moon. We told him we had yeah. the moon man helmet, which is, I think, the biggest helmet ever. Mm -hmm. um, but those are the, the two slots. I like video games because you get to say sentences like, there's only one head slot. And we're like, yeah, got it. Okay. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> that tracks. Uh, Cameron Banks, uh, who we already had a question from, but he followed up with an, another thing and was curious about, it. are there any benefits to playing on harder difficulties aside from additional flaws? Uh, for example, would you be getting better loot or anything like that? Because some of our creatures will scale, not all of them, but some of them scale within a range. If you're playing, actually, no, that's only gonna be on level. What, do, what advantage do you have? I think we have an achievement for playing on the hardest difficulty. I don't. I think it's more the kind, just the kind of experience you want as a player. Yeah. Whether yeah. you want a harder experience or the or the you know the hardcore supernova mode, or whether you're you know playing on the story mode where you you want to be more in depth with the story and take less time with combat and things like that. Yeah. Felix Nichols is dying to know. Uh, I'd like to know more about the leadership role you can play in the Outer Worlds. What, is, what inspired this addition, and do you think other RPGs should follow suit with this new skill set? Yes, everybody should use this as a template for their future games. Because um, that's the way you want to play games. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, I want to play their games. Yeah. Um, 
part of it was, I mean, it's been 20 years since the Fallout combat stealth dialogue, you know, um, thing that we we pushed really hard in, in a lot of our subsequent games too. And it always occurred to me that we were missing something. And what we seem to be missing is based on the personality of the character. I mean, you have dialogue is one thing, but dialogue is always like an end to itself. And there was nothing that seemed to be player controllable companion at, attributes. And so when we came up with the leader skills, there's actually a category of skills for leader. Those are things that you use to control specific things about your companion. And that seemed to indicate to us an entire new way of playing the game. And at first we thought of it as a new path, like those first three, but then we realized it kind of folds on top of those. So it's kind of like a hybrid. So like there's this, you can play a stealth guy, but a stealth leader hybrid plays very differently. He's not some lone guy sneaking around. He's got a group of people sneaking around. The dialogue um, leader hybrid is thinking about who he's bringing along and what they're contribute to conversations and his own dialogue skills. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens when we add that, and it makes me actually wonder what other character archetypes are waiting for us to find. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Mike Selva also wants to know, uh, outside of combat and dialogue, what kind of RPG gameplay can we expect? Are there many opportunities to use non-combat skills? Yeah, we have this one whole level that I've stealthed through so many times that I actually fought through it yesterday because I wanted to see what it was like not to talk or or fight my way through it. Um, well, and there is also within dialogues, we check other skills besides just your um, talking skills. You know, if you have a high engineering, high perception. medical perception, you know, all those things. We, we don't check those, obviously, as much as the dialogue skills, but we check those as well in dialogue. Okay. Uh, Tyler Steele, I was wondering, how do you feel about gameplay-based progression in role-playing games? Like in Skyrim, your skills improve as you participate in the respective activities. Your games, on the other hand, tend to have skill point allocation at level-ups. What factors into your decisions on how to handle character progression? It's interesting. I've, I've thought about skill prog skill based progression a lot because it you're right it seems weird that you know I kill three bandits and then I get better at lock picking but at the same time it always feels strange like when I'm playing those games I feel like I better not ever pass a door or a chest you know or a locked container without trying to open it because that's the only way I will ever have to improve that skill right so they both have their pros and cons um, probably one day I'll try that right. one but uh, I always seem to gravitate back towards level-based progression because it's just very simple to understand and simple to explain to people. I'm always scared of uh, the, it always seems very ex uh, exploit, uh, you know, it's, it's vulnerable to exploits. Um, so whenever we talk about maybe approaching something like that, I get a little nervous, but the Tim has to worry about that. The stuff, original so. Wasteland, <laughs> um, you could just point your character to Sand Dune and jam a pencil in the key for jumping, <laughs> and he'd just jump on the Sand Dune and slide down and jump and slide down. You go have lunch, come back, and your jump skill is like maxed. <laughs> back when games were good, damn it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Matt Jasek wants to know, I want to know uh, why they decided to go with a classless RPG system instead of, uh, instead of traditional classes. Too many RPGs are doing this, and it seems antithetical to the whole idea of a role-playing game. I like classes... In fact, I, I almost would say I demand them. If it's a multiplayer game and you have to be able to explain to the other players, this is what my character contributes. But for solo games, I really like skills and not classes as a progression means because it's, you, it, lets, it lets you have more freedom in playing however you want. And since the games we've made, the RPGs we've made have all been classes, I take, I take issue with <laughs> people saying that that's not true RPG experience. <laughs> Agent Riot is wondering, is there level scaling? Yes, but it's, it's not used on everything, and it's, it's in a range. So when you come into a zone, um, some creatures are, are, they look at your level, and they change their level slightly up, lower or above than what they were planned to be. Um, but we keep it capped to a certain range, so you're never going to go into a newbie zone late in the game and have everything be super powerful. Okay. Yeah, we wanted you to. We didn't want to lose the, um, you know, the classic RPG move of like I went somewhere and just got destroyed. I'm going to go get better and just yeah. lay waste to everybody. We we really wanted to maintain that because that's half the fun of, of these types of games is is getting your, getting your ass kicked and coming back and dealing some damage. Yeah, for sure. 
Uh, Seagull Mark II has a surreal question for you. Uh, they ask, will they be blocking the door you're trying to go through? <laughs> what is, uh, what yeah, that's not surreal. That's, I know exactly what he's talking about. No, they will not. <laughs> In fact, they can't even block you. Your companions cannot block you. Oh, As right. I don't know. I don't know what he's talking about at all. I, I changed my answer. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, well, let's switch gears a little bit. We had some folks that had questions about combat-related stuff. Uh, Snipper1226 wanted to know uh, if one's own character can play purely melee instead of using guns. Funny you should ask, Snipper. <laughs> I'm doing that this week. Oh, awesome. And I can tell you, I'm not very good at it. Charlie keeps telling me to get good. Um, <laughs> but I'm managing it. And it's. I think it's harder... Because everything you attack, I mean, they're shooting at you while you're running up to them. But I've gotten better at block, and I've gotten slightly better at dodging, which are two skills in the game. Um, and it is not only possible, but it's an expected playthrough path that we're testing. So at this point, you're able to play through the entire game without VO, and I'm sure a lot of other things aren't in there, but that's the level of the game you're at? Oh, yeah. Oh, We've been able yeah. to play through start to finish for a while. How is it? It's fun. Okay, cool. I've gotten to the end several times in different methods. That's cool. So, uh, it's always hard to judge your own to judge your own work, but we're having a good time with it. Yeah. Anything surprising after finishing a full playthrough? Like, oh, it turns out our game is more this than I expected. I mean, there were a few things, and we've gone back and changed them. Where it's like, hey, it's been two hours, and I haven't done anything but talk to people. Yeah. Maybe we could, you know, this area needs a little more um, other things to do. Uh, but we've gone back and, and, and balanced those areas. And also, I think the one of my more recent playthroughs, that when I finished, it dropped me into a black, empty room and just left me there. <laughs> and I'm like, hey. You didn't wait long enough for the fake slides to start. <laughs> What's <laughs> happening here? Sounds like a weird existential play or something. that you. That's a legit ending, man. Uh, think about what you did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kerwin Smith is curious... Uh, in terms of the game's combat, will there be any unarmed, uh, well, yes, unarmed weaponry, but uh, unarmed options, I'm sure is what he means, and skills. Um, uh, again, and, and this is getting to be a common theme, but like the kind seen in a Fallout game. We had, uh, I'd be raising the time and budget, we actually had an unarmed skill under melee, and we took it out because of all the extra animations that were required. Um, however, you can... Um, when you disarm uh, an enemy, they will punch you. Yeah, you can't really. Um, and once again, it's things like this are deceptive because it seems like, well, just, just have an animation of the guy punching or your character punching. That's not a big deal. But you have to continually balance for those things and make sure it's still fun. And and it's 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 a it's a. But also, you have to look. Fun, it has to look right. Punching something down on the ground here. Punching yeah. something man size. Punching a mantisaur in its face, which is you know ten feet over your head. So it was hard to make all those look good. Yeah. Uh, apropos of nothing, I'm sure, from this user and the way that they like to play games, Shane is curious, will there be dismemberment? Yeah. Well, there, there's, <laughs> when, you, when you kill somebody in a very gruesome fashion, there is a chance that they would explode or parts of their body will fly off. Tim, you seem uh, really excited you, about you this. Can't, you can't pull the Monty Python Black Knight thing where you cut them down one limb at a time, though. It looks pretty cool, though, when they lose limbs. <laughs> the technical term is jibbing, I think. Mm -hmm. Can you turn gore off? I've never tried. <laughs> have to I do not what an interesting hypothetical question. <laughs> All right. I don't even think we have that setting yet. Yeah. No. Okay. We should probably look into that. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> uh, Thanks for that question. <laughs> uh, Jason Kobe asks... What's the name of your favorite weapon in the game? Hmm. I don't think we've announced it yet. Yeah, I, that's a very sneaky question. It is sneaky. Uh -huh. It's one of the science weapons that we haven't talked about yet. Can you give uh -huh. initials? <laughs> no. <laughs> wow. Wait, N-O. Good initials. All right, we got it. Uh, <laughs> all right, sorry, Jason. Your, your sneaky question did not get through. Uh, Matt West asks, uh, so often when I am loving a game and want to play it, but either don't have the time or mental capacity at the moment to take in the story, I just put on a podcast and grind out my character for 30 minutes to an hour. So my question is, 
Will there be opportunities to grind in this game? And if so, how much? There are places you can just go and fight things if yeah. you want. I'm more interested in how, how often your mental capacity goes up and down. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. That's, that's a all I, I really, say, yeah, I, I, pre- <laughs> I really like that's this a, person's question. Yeah, that's a longer discussion. <laughs> yeah. He really, we there, got there a lot of background there. There are places to there. grind. Um, I'm just trying to think. Now, I, we probably don't want to bring some of that stuff up. Well, you go to the monster planet. It's the yeah. lot of places you can just run around and fight monsters. Okay. It's the monster planet. There's a monster planet? Yeah, we talked about that. It's the the whole monarch thing. They yeah. call it. It's the it's monster, planet. The monster planet. Where the terraforming okay. went wrong. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Also, and everything's big. It's not exactly, it's not like grinding per se, but if you just want to zone out and you know you have save slots, just you could go murder everybody in the game. Right. That's still an option. I. I oh yeah. I, I, st- I I still remember doing that at, during Fallout. At the end of every testing session, I would just start killing everybody i think <laughs> can't take it Just anymore to see what happens. I, th- yeah. that, actually it begs, out your frustrations begs an interesting question will in those spaces like out on monarch where you're going around and you're just like oh, i'm gonna go kill some monsters did the do they come back or is that like yeah there's, okay. there's respawn okay um however i should warn you i did that once and one of my companions commented to me when we got back to the ship so they will they will make you feel bad. <laughs> like, why are you such a murderous bastard kind of thing? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, I Suck at Video Games wants to know, can you give us a four-word sentence of the plot without spoiling anything? <laughs> I like this question. Uh, four words. I'm defrosted. Let's, uh, let's explore. <laughs> ah, nice job. Well done. I'm defrosted. Save colonists. <laughs> all right all right there's a little patch that works maverick Maybe. moore says uh it has been mentioned that the timeline in the outer world split off from ours around einstein's time how different is it the timeline i mean uh than ours in terms of technology pop culture etc um it's very much inspired by the robber barons and turn of the century obviously um it's progressed since then but we try to maintain a lot of that feel we don't within the game get into a lot of what the differences are back on Earth or possibly in other colonies. We mentioned some of it, but we want, apart from the, the, the culture and the co- in the colony that you're currently playing, we kind of want to leave some of that as a surprise as we progress through the, the series, hopefully progress through the series, of like discovering more and more things about what this, the history is, is all about. Wasn't there a Reddit theory about McKinley? I was going to say that. that. Somebody came up with uh, pretty much exactly what we had written on our timeline page on Reddit. About about how uh, how and where it's, it's split off. These guys are too clever. Okay. What was the theory? Sorry to say it. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty obvious if you listen to what we talk about in the robber barons and Teddy Roosevelt never broke them up. Is that um, the reason Teddy Roosevelt became president in the first place was because uh, McKinley was assassinated by an anarchist, and that's kind of all you need to know. If he didn't die from for, if if it was a failed attempt instead of a successful anarchist attempt on his life, that kind of sets the sets the ground rules for a, a totally different future where the trusts weren't broken up and, and anarchism is a thing. So McKinley's, a, a, like, that, that's the moment, huh? Uh, we're not, we didn't, we haven't, there's other things we've talked about in there, but that's, that's a component of it, I guess we'd say. Yeah, that's so, cool. Huh. And I haven't compared that, that was like turn of the century, and then we did want to incorporate some of Einstein's theories, but not all of them, so it's, it's somewhere around there. Like boo on quantum mechanics. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. right, right. Uh, okay, where were we, Miller? Oh, here it is. Um, so PTN says, hey, I've seen Firefly mentioned as a reference a couple times, but the focus on corporate future- futurism reminds me of another sci-fi TV show that's a beloved classic, Futurama. How often does Futurama come up as a Wait, reference? Wait, I'm, I'm Futurama? <laughs> I'm not sure I know that one. Uh, I don't hear Tim talking about that all the time. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> Is it tough to love something that much and be like, oh, did Futurama do this? Let me check the Futurama wiki. Yep, okay, they have this, they have this. We just love, Futurama has done so many great. Yeah. I don't, I, I, well, Tim is, Tim is a walking encyclopedia of Futurama and The Simpsons. <laughs> so if we're generally 90% of the time, if, if we're doing something, it's, it's more of a, 
maybe a riff on what they've done or, or a, an alternate take on it, but but we already we know what they've done, or I shouldn't say we. So Tim is, Tim knows what they've done in both of those shows. So is our writer Natai Padar. He's a he's a yes. walking encyclopedia of Simpsons as well. We sometimes just go back and forth. So when he's having mental downtime, we have caught him a couple times with not being able to catch our Simpsons quotes. His mental faculties go up and down. Right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Edward asks at the beginning of the Outer Worlds, how much will the player character already be established, or will he or she have memory loss to account for his not being known by the player? His life not being no, a player. Yeah, you get to make your character um, as you're making it. Um, it's 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 a blank. We try to make it, um, and this is something we've done every time. We try to make the character as much of a blank slate as possible, so that the player can really decide everything they want about that that character. Um, you've come to this call, so that's that was the generation, in a lot of ways, of the setup for the story. The fact that you come from someplace else, you were frozen. The frozen does do weird things to you, but it doesn't necessarily kill your memory because your memory doesn't matter here because you have no, apart from what you were sold before you got there, which is all completely incorrect, you don't know anything about the colony. There is a fun part of character creation though where you are you get to select what career you tested best for and they're all really sad, demeaning jobs. <laughs> But I do want to point out with that, it, those, and this is a, another instance of time and budget, we did really want to have backgrounds that affected um, you know, certain things about the game and quests, and, mm. and we, we stripped those back to just, it's, it's kind of a way for us to give you another bonus. It's almost like a tag skill or, or adding more. Um, and there's kind of funny things. So basically the conceit is that this is what you tested well at. It has no bearing on the kind of character you're playing. It's just, it's just kind of a funny lore-based way of giving you extra points. Yeah. Yoda's Llama, that is surprisingly difficult to say, uh, is wondering why the insistence of a mute protagonist in this game? Oh, simply because, well, there's two reasons. Um, the biggest one is that we like, once again, the player defining everything they can about their character. And even if we could, if we tried to come up with a voice, an act, cast a voice, we'd either have to cast several versions of it, which would you know, explode our cost considerably and limit the amount of options we give the player in, in dialogue. And then I don't care how many voices we gave you. Um, obviously, if we had unlimited budget, maybe there's there's some discussion there. But, you know, let's say we gave you three. There's a really good chance that none of those three are what you envisioned for your character. And it can be really disconcerting hearing this voice that you didn't um, that you didn't picture. And the other part of that is is having that um, to me, you really need very cinematic camera work and um, the 3D, you know, your character interacting with the world a lot. Because you don't just pick the line you're going to say and then you say that line. It's the whole thing where you're summarizing the line, then you're seeing a cinematic of it play out. And that's, that's all time and money. Yeah. But even beyond that, even if we had those resources, we, I feel like we would have fallen on this side of the line anyways because we really like having the, the, the player be a blank slate so the, uh, the, the character be a bit a blank slate so the player can fully define and Think them. of all the different ways the player could say the line, tell me what I want to know. I mean, there's a million ways you could say that. In your head, it's, you're saying it, you're clicking on that, and it's, it's in your head the way you want it to be. It may not be that way that the voice of your choice is saying it. Plus, I don't think there's any voice actor that can pull off the dumb line without being jarring. <laughs> That's so much funnier to just imagine what that voice is sounding like. You know, it's like, yeah. idiocracy is much better in theory than actually watching it again. Because, like, yeah, it turns out everybody's just kind of annoying the way they're <laughs> acting in that movie. Um, yeah. Jean-Claude wants to know, can you progress through the whole game without, oh, progress through the whole game lying to everyone? Yeah, well, you, every time you a lie comes up, you can pick it. There are... Um, what we try to do is when you, when we give you the option to choose lie or any of your dialogue skills, if you choose that, if we've given you that option, it's a success. Um, because we feel like if you choose those lines and you don't get a benefit from it, it doesn't have to be a complete success, but if you don't get some benefit from it, it almost feels like a cheat or like I've wasted points. Um, so uh, there we've, we've gone to great lengths to make sure that there are a lot of places where you can use your dialogue skills and it's very effective. Did the compulsive liar flaw make it in? No, it did not. <sighs> there was a flaw that once you lie a few times, it offers you a flaw that you can't not lie if a lie, if a lie line comes up. 
And that was that was a fun way to play. Well, because see, and once wild. again, this is an insight into our design discussions that we have. I kept pointing out that if <laughs> if every time you pick a lie, it's a success. That's not a flaw. He did point that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it turns out fun isn't fun. You're wrong, Tim. <laughs> Uh, well, it's it's not a flaw. It's a, it's it's like uh, that's what I would have done it's a anyway. Super I put benefit. my points into lie. I'm His gonna lie all the time. Was flawless. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the few instances when we can say that. Uh, David Riley has a question specifically for Tim. Uh, has Leonard ever proposed an idea you consider too dark or morose? This week, <laughs> <laughs> the original <laughs> ending of Fallout. Ooh. When he told me that the game was going to end by you being kicked out of the vault. <laughs> I was like, we can't do that. People will kill us. <laughs> and that's the game. That's the, that's what we shipped with. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, he proposed that ending and I was like, no, that's too dark. That's too, that's too sad. And we shipped it and it's now considered a really good ending. I don't know <laughs> if this has more to do with my memory or my stubbornness, but I don't really, I remember him being a little shocked. I don't remember him saying we're not going to do it because in my once once me and Jason came up with that idea, I was like, we're doing it. <laughs> so maybe I just don't remember you vehemently uh, saying we weren't going to do, you do it. Do you remember what my idea for the thing was? The balloons and yeah, the party. Yeah, a party with balloons and a cake. <laughs> <laughs> That's very not that is, that is such a great anecdote about your partnership. <laughs> uh, it's pretty great. Uh, Monferno is curious about uh, some of the dark humor in the game. Uh, whether there will, in addition to those th those humorous moments, whether there's times that you're actually going to go for some genuine emotional moments. Yeah, uh, we don't want the humor to get in the way of uh, the characters feeling, I don't want to say realistic because it's a video game and there are very, a lot of them are a little bit on the caricature side due to necessity because we don't want to have you having 20 minute conversations with every NPC you run into. Right. But one of the things we like to do, and, and it's always our goal, is to have those emotional moments, to have moments that on the surface are funny, um, but they're also very, I don't want, not necessarily moving, but they, they have an emotional impact to them. So we never, or we try to never let the humor um, take over and, and just be humor for the sake of humor. Oh yeah, like when you find out why two people in the starting in the original zone and Moveo are mad at each other, it's a dark reason. Hmm. Not funny. Uh, that same user followed up and was curious if there's. Uh, they, they know that there's no romance, but uh, they're curious if there's ways that you can really genuinely deepen a friendship with your squad mates. If you, the where we where we set it up was, um, they all have background stories and things they want to accomplish themselves. <laughs> And if you do that for them, it, for a few of them especially, it really, it deepens your relationship with them because you've done something for them that's very personal to them. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, I, it's, it's uh, there is that aspect to it, but the other aspect that we really wanted for your companions was, at least in a couple of instances, the ability to turn them, to kind of turn them away from their goals, um, which in some instances could be argued makes them a worse person um, but we wanted you to be able to influence your companions. Um, and there are a couple instances where they will leave you if you push them too hard or do certain very specific things that you know that they don't want you to do. Hmm. Uh, so I guess the more effective part, there are parts I think where they do feel like they've, they've grown because of what you've done and you become better friends. But I think there's, there's more dramatic instances of where you've turned them the other way. Uh, our reader, Ulzang Goddess, uh, has a kind of a related question to that subject. I, they say, I know there's no romance in the Outer Worlds, but is there any point in the game where I can choose a dialogue option with the words, I love you? <laughs> That's so sweet. I don't think so. Yeah, you just recently reread a lot of our... I, I haven't gotten through all of them yet. We're still, we're still working on it. I don't think so. Um, I'm not ruling it out. Player character incapable of love is their biggest flaw. We I like the today. specificity oh. of that question. Like this person just <laughs> desperately wants like those eight letters. Please, they can't say it in their lives. They need a video game yeah. to really give them that that delivery well, system. Well, you know, I, this almost contradicts what I just said. I do think there are moments of the, where you can really connect with your companions. Yeah. And and they talk about you know being a family and that whole um, that whole kind of vibe. 
Um, you know, none of them have, have real family relationships anymore. And of course, the whole trope of, of the crew, the tight knit crew becoming the family. So you do have those moments. I don't think you, anyone ever says to each other that they love, they love them, but that's, it's kind of like an undercurrent for, for your relationship with your crew. I think the closest we get is when you say, I love you, spaces, choice, pump action, <laughs> <laughs> but I can't think of, I love you. Period. Uh, Draco Jocks is curious if there is a pirate faction. Please be a space pirate faction in the game. He follows up. Um, there are space pirates. Yeah. We recently, we recently changed their name from space pirate, um, but they are definitely space pirates. Um, I don't. I don't think they're organized enough to be a full faction. There's groups of them that you can get on the wrong side of, but. Um, when I hear faction, I think of ones that run throughout the whole game or that can make a huge impact. Um, uh, you know, like if, if for it to be a full faction for me, it would mean that there's a bunch of pirates associated with each other, that if you crossed one or two of them, all the pirates in the, in the game would, would, uh, you know, well, have a, have a bad reputation. You'd have a bad reputation with Since I was just reviewing the armors, there is a spacer's choice eye patch you can get. <laughs> so why don't you be the space pirate? <laughs> Awesome. There you go, Draco. Uh, Solid Ghost is curious. Uh, this is, is, a, is a cool question, actually. Can I take over one of the corporations? They're thinking. No. Okay. Long pause uh, before I'm trying that. to think if I want to say anything else about it, and the answer to that is no. Okay. Yeah, there was a, there was a uh, quest line we took out that involved a lot of corporate intrigue and eventually left one you could you could make one powerful and the other not but no okay it's a it's something i don't know if we ever directly talked about on the cover story trip but it is a very funny if you just a situation when you zoom out a little bit the idea of you guys making this game all about giant corporations as obsidian was purchased by a giant corporation uh, i did i do think i said that the irony wasn't lost on us but in one of our interviews that's true a complete coincidence <laughs> is that surreal very much so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Liam Mahan asks, what level of freedom can we expect in structuring the story and the ending? Are there various set paths or can those paths intertwine based on your choices? There's a lot of intertwining. Yeah, I mean, I think the without going into a, a lengthy uh, explanation, I think the best way to look at that is how we've handled it in our previous games. Um, there's, you know, there's a couple, you know, the two big choices are like siding with, you know, which side do you side with? Um, are you going to side with, with the scientists? Are you going to side with the board? Um, but within those two choices, there's, there's all the gradations of like, you know, what you want to do, what kind of character you've played, what you've done along the way. Um, and we handle all of that, of course, in the end slides. Uh, one of our users, Squilliam, uh, appears to know a little something about uh, some of the, the folks that you have working on the game and, uh, and asks about uh, one of your writers, Chris. Yes? Chris uh, Latoy? Chris Latois. Yeah. Latois. Um, and, and it believes is it, that, that that person's working on the outer worlds. And, and so they're curious if um, uh, they say if, if I, they just wanted to know, as a fellow sci-fi game, if The Outer Worlds directly takes any inspiration from Mass Effect. Since Chris um, wrote on Mass Effect, yeah. The idea. I don't, I, I would, you know, I think we've all played the Mass Effect series. I think there's probably some things we've uh, been inspired by. Um, I feel like we approach it completely differently. Um, so... It's hard to say because I think there's I think you could point to things that, that Bioware has done in the games or even Bethesda has done in their games that kind of like cross feed across all the different RPGs. Um, but I mean, looking at the Mass Effect series, that's a very specific type of space fantasy op opera, and we're a very different type of uh, of game than that. Um, but yeah, Chris has brought his expertise from that series over here and and the things he learned working on it. I've always thought you guys should talk to the people who made that Fallout game way back when. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, that. I, those guys are jerks. I, I don't <laughs> like them. That original game, yeah. Um, Bennett Ormond asks, I am wondering if after we complete the main story, 
Will we be able to continue playing on that playthrough? Or will our playthrough end once we finish the story? Right now, the playthrough will end. Okay. Time and money. <laughs> you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. We'd love to have it happen. I'm not sure it'll happen. Okay. Mm. Uh, Kalexel says, I'm loving the whole setting of the game world. Would love to know more about it. Are there any plans for books or comics to explore the game world and the characters more? Not currently, but I love that idea. I would love to do things like that. Great. If you could choose any medium, what would you go for? Uh, Mikey over here is whispering comics. Uh, <laughs> I love comics. I would love to do that. Um, it, it's hard to say because there's just, there's so many, like if we were to do a comic, it would be a certain type of story. If we did a, a novel, it would be a different one. Um, I, I could I could go either way, but you know I I am a huge fan of comics from from very early on, so I would love to see a comic book. We have so many consumable goods, and Leonard doesn't know I want to do this. Um, <laughs> that and I love the art for it. The art form is so good that I, I wanted to do a thing where it's like, hey, how to make this food product at home? Oh, you know, boy. like make Spacer's Choice, you know, tarmac and cheese at home. <laughs> so is this is this the long? Uh, rumored Tim's uh, recipe book. Yeah, that it'd, we're be talking a about. it'd be a cookbook. Mm. For, I love that. For outer the worlds. Outer Worlds yeah. recipe book. Different yeah. poisoning strategies. I think ultimately. What you want to do but yeah. to approximate the food is get some salmon and then some tuna, <laughs> and put them in a blender. Add some rocks. Add some rocks. Make yeah. sure you get the rocks in there. <laughs> but it'd be. It'd also be an art book because you also <laughs> get the original artwork of these. You know, I, yeah, I think I, you I should absolutely to, to, pursue this. I would love to have an art book. Like a table, like a coffee table book. Oh. Yeah. A lot of people were asking about a collector's edition. Have you guys had any discussions about that? Um, no, not really, not yeah. at this point. Okay. Uh, okay, focusing on development. We got a lot of questions here. Uh, no one, which is confusing, no one asks, uh, I understand budget restraints, but couldn't you deliver a third-person experience for players who can't stand first-person experiences? It was a whole new set of animations. Yeah, it's it's, it's it not just, it, it doubled everything. It's not just the animations; it's also the camera control and uh, making sure that all of yeah, the places sure. you go to can handle the third-person camera, and dealing with all the bugs that that introduces. Um, and we just wanted to concentrate. If we if we did that, that means we're taking less time away from from the first person. Um, so we kind of I think had to choose which one we wanted to go with, and we wanted it to be a first-person experience. Um, could we add one later or, you know, uh, hopefully people will mod it too. Um, that would be fantastic. We'd love to be able to do it. It wasn't, a, it wasn't something we didn't want to do or didn't think it would be valuable. It just added a whole new um, set of problems to deal with. Yeah, for sure. Uh, in the demo we saw, at least, it seemed like when your character was idle for a little bit, the camera would pull out to third person and kind of float around them. Is that still in the game? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's a great way too to it, you get to see what you're wearing and what you look like in that environment. Yeah, uh, the god wants to know what was the hardest thing to scale back on in development. Um, well, I think <laughs> every person you'd ask would probably tell you the stuff that they had to cut that they loved was the hardest thing to cut back on. So I would, of course, say some of our story, um, some of the places we had planned for you to visit, and some of the quests we had planned for you. I'm sure Tim would talk at length about some of the uh, skill, um, it's not skill, uh, system things we had to cut back on. Um, it really became, uh, we, we really tried to focus on what the core game was that we wanted to make and how can we make that game, uh, with the time and money we have, how can we make that game uh, the best it can be? So, you know, if the stuff we're considering really can, can be considered something that we could lose and still craft this great game, then we, we would cut it. Yeah. Uh, Derek Kent is wondering uh, about, like, based on the B-roll you guys have released so far, uh, how finalized that gameplay is. He's wondering, like, some of the maybe hiccups and transitions and stuff like that. Do you think those are going to be present in the final game? Well, pretty much we're at a phase now where we're closing down tasks on, like, getting, you know, finishing and getting content in and getting features done. And then it's nothing but bug fixing and optimization until we ship. So we're hoping we're hoping to have all of that stuff smooth. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, the and our our goal is to create a seamless, smooth experience, and you know, hopefully, we'll we'll achieve that. Um, but even just talking about like uh, the gameplay, the fighting, the combat gameplay, um, every week it gets better. It's being iterated on. It's being smoothed out. It's being made a better experience. And um, you know, 
it's so different even from three weeks ago. And that B-roll is how many months old now? Two? Isn't that from like, I thought we started in like November. Yeah. I mean, we work on oh, six. We're, oh, that's the late. Well, okay, we work on six week one. milestones with our publisher, with yeah. Prime Division. And sometimes they get something and then they'll come down a few weeks later. And it's a, it, the, the area that they're looking at is very different because sure. they're like, oh, wait, this doesn't look like anything what you sent us. I'm like, yeah, it's been three weeks. <laughs> that's wild. Uh, Callum Nicholson was curious. That, uh, th this person remembered that one of you, they weren't sure uh, which one of you, had mentioned in the past that you like to do post-game write-ups for games and RPGs that you've, that, um, that you've played, including the more that recent fallouts. Mm -hmm. um, is there any chance we'll ever see them publicly? Maybe even... No. No? <laughs> okay. Well, I, there you go. I'm very brutal when I write up the post-mortem of any game, including my own. Yeah. Um, so I don't really show them. Do you, do you burn them afterwards? You go out, out back to the trash can and... You no, know, I keep them. <laughs> what, if, what about like but, a Mark Twain autobiography type of thing where like 100 years after you've passed on, you just release all these reports about all the Mass Effects and Fallouts? Wouldn't that be great? I have a running joke that I wanted to write a book when I retired uh -huh. about my experience in the game industry, but I'm just worried I'll get sued. So <laughs> maybe pos posthumously. Posthumously. Yeah. But then... I don't want anyone to kill me so my book comes out. Yeah. <laughs> Shrewd. Uh, Squilliam had a question uh, that gets brought up a lot when discussing Fallout lore, they think. Um, and while I know Tim and Leonard have no control over this now, and it could have changed, uh, they just want to know if when they first created Fallout, did they create it with transistors not existing in the Fallout world in their mind, or was that just something that fans made up? Uh, neither one of those, if you want to be technic technical about it. Because um, when we first started Fallout, we just figured it was going to be just pure Mad Max, post-war, post-nuclear, um, standard kind of adventure. And then when I came up with the 50s thing, it was really a tone and art thing. And then Tim started looking at all the stuff with all the vacuum tubes. And he, he was the one who came up with the idea that they never developed transistors. That would explain all the technology. Yeah, so we never, we didn't start out with that. And the art came first and Tim came up with the explanation. So technically it was from us, it wasn't the fans, but it wasn't, it wasn't where we started from. Yeah, That's interesting. Uh, Mr. Sixes is curious if any of the ideas you've had for Outer Worlds uh, were ones that came out of the canceled isometric RPG that was being shopped around during the uh, end of the Troika days. There, uh, this person, Mr. Sixes, is curious because they're a huge Bloodlines fan and found out that you guys didn't close right after Bloodlines but were shopping an RPG that never got picked up. Oh, I thought they were talking about that demo that got leaked. Um, no, a lot of that um, was based, some of the demos we were shopping around, well, we, there was the one isometric one and then there was a couple that there was one or two that were based on um, va pseudo vampire type yeah. things. Yeah. Um, I don't think we got very far with any of them. So there was really not, it was mostly just visual and kind of here's a really high level pitch. Um, and they were very much based around whatever those specific worlds were. I was looking at the system mechanics that I was writing at the time. And that's when I started having the idea about hybrids. Um, but I don't think we got far enough to actually yeah. say this game is yeah. about that. Yeah. So it wasn't a sci-fi thing or anything like that. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. This was a surprisingly common question. I was shocked. Morden wants to know: Can you see your feet in the outer worlds if you look down? No. No. Okay. But, but you can in the third person camera. You can in the third person. Yeah. 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 So when it's like rotating around you, not when you're moving, you can see your feet then. There's all kind of technical reasons for it that I don't know. Why is that a common question? I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. We don't know, I don't know either. why we can't, but I know it had to do with technical issues. And I don't know if it's a fetish issue on the community side, but <laughs> it was all over the place. It's confusing. Well, it, surprisingly, what that means is we had to come up with a system for how footsteps worked. Yeah. Oh. So that was that was problematic in, in and of itself. That's bizarre. Vaughn wants to know, is there going to be some kind of in-game encyclopedia about factions, enemies, weapons? Um, not a codex uh, like like he's asking about or she whoever is asking about can't tell from the names. Um, the um, we didn't we wanted to do everything kind of like feeling more in world and we didn't want to have a lot of 
um, reliable narration, I guess you'd say. When you find stuff in the game, it's very first person or, um, or propaganda from one side or the other. So there's no authoritative, this is like the encyclopedia of what actually happened in this world or, or, or uh, you know, information about this, this, uh, this species or whatever. Okay. Uh, Taylor's wants to know about load screens. I don't expect zero, but some games load so often and for so long it takes away from the experience. How are you guys feeling about load screens or in your game? Uh, we try to keep them to a minimum, but because of the nature of what we're doing, they are they are necessary. We're trying to make them as as uh, as infrequent and as quick as possible. Um, but we don't want to make them too quick because we do have the cool uh, loading screens that that talk about or reactive to what you've done in the game. I can tell you, our load our save games are fast. Yeah. We load and save the game. It's like boop. I was like super impressed with that. Nice. Go program. There we go. Zexistential is wondering if you have a composer locked in for the game yet that you can announce. Um, In-house, we're using uh, Justin Bell, who's our audio director. Awesome. Faceless Knights, is there going to be a photo mode? No. Okay. Carcamon uh, is wondering if the game's going to be released on Mac and Linux. We are not not that we know of at this point. <laughs> okay, uh, Demo Vitron is wondering if it's going to be released on good old games. Not sure. Yeah, we're not. Sure. Okay, that's some weird end game decisions. Uh, Epic Store, same case of not sure. Yeah. Okay, you look. Your game designers here. Okay, let's get back to the yeah. important questions. Chris Cabezas <laughs> wants to know: Are there bathrooms in the game? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. And you have to go in them sometimes, and it's gross. Why do you have to go in them? Because sometimes something you're looking for may be in a bathroom, oh, interesting. like near the toilet, and okay. you have to pick it up. Am I being too specific? That's good. You're, it's getting, gross. you're getting close to being too specific. Okay. <laughs> so, yes. All right. Tyrone Israel wants to know, will the game have dynamic weather? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Andy Morris wants to know, are those planets always statically hanging there in the sky, or will they move? Uh, they don't. They don't move the way he's asking. They're like, for instance, the, the gas planet, the, the Jupiter-like planet, has animation on it, so you see it, um, the like, storms or whatever, moving on it, but it stays in the same place in the sky. Well, that's because Monarch is title locked. Sure. Let's talk about sure. that. That's, 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 why, that's why it's that way. Uh, Andy also has a much less technical question, wondering, are there beards in the game? I've seen zero beards so far. Yes, there are beards there in the game. Beards. There is facial hair and beards and scars and dirt. Everybody in this room right now is bearded. <laughs> we have beards in the game. It's very important. Uh, Felisk wants to know, if the Outer Worlds was a chocolate bar, what... Uh, help me out, Miller. How do you pronounce cacao. it? Cacao. What cacao percentage would it be? What country would it be sourced from? And what would the flavor be like? It would be 85%. It would be single origin from Ecuador. It would have an earthy, roasted flavor. Wow. And we all know exactly what that means for how long the game's going to be. I think that's the national <laughs> connection there. Uh, let's see. Okay. Adam O'Patrony is saying, hey, guys, I'm super excited for this game, but I do have one question. With Obsidian now joining Microsoft First Party, will there be some interesting exclusive content for Microsoft users? Uh, not, not that we've talked about at this point. All let's right. say no. Let's say no. Brand Flakes is saying, hey, what's the biggest secret ab about what the studio is working on that you're allowed to tell us? <laughs> We've got this really cool game, Outer Worlds, that's, that's going to be awesome. Mm hmm Okay. And Outer Worlds 2 isn't in development secretly somewhere else, right? Nope. Okay. Not that they told us. <laughs> <laughs> in exile. Is there something we should know? <laughs> we have something to tell you guys. <laughs> Oh, oh, this is to me. Uh, Bethesda Ware wants to know, can we expect a possible sequel to continue the story of the, of the character we create in this game with our choices carrying over? Um, we haven't done... We've talked in broad terms about we'd want, what we'd want from a sequel, um, but probably not. I, I don't want to commit to anything, obviously, because we might come up with a great idea that, that, that has that. But, you know, we like to, we like to kind of, like... Uh, give you a different starting point in different games, um, kind of like the the Fallout model, where you're a different character uh, facing different different uh, uh, situations, you know. And it also keeps us from being locked into well, this game happens like a year later. It's like we could, you know, in the original Fallout, we jumped ahead 80 years. Um, and we're really just devoting all our energy to this game right now. 
Yeah, I so, can for all imagine. I know, tomorrow we'll come up with this fantastic idea that, that takes place five minutes after this game is over and <laughs> uses the exact same character and companions. There we go. Username name men res you is wondering, is the Outer Worlds going to be at E3 this year? We'll see. Mm-hmm. Is we'll what see. our we'll PR see. guy is telling us. All right, good job, PR guy. Okay, number one question. Obviously, you knew this was coming. James Rush is wondering, uh, hey, I think everyone here is sold in the game already, which leaves the most important question, when does it release? In 2019. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, do you have comments on the recent August 6th rumor that popped up due to a listing on Steam? No. Does that seem... Somebody made a mistake somewhere, I guess. I don't know. That, that was nothing to do with us. Tim, do you have a date in your mind right now that you know the game's going to be released on? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that feels like a yes. All right. That's tough. Oh, here's a nice one. Uh, DTVHR says, how are y'all doing? You're releasing a game with a huge amount of hype that is being compared to some gigantic games out there. Combined with the fact you must be working really long weeks to finish the game, promote it, test it, and drop follow and drop follow patches. I have to ask, how are you doing? Are you all okay? Do you need a cup of tea? They're concerned Probably about your well-being. Cup of coffee. <laughs> um, I, we're doing good. It's it's really tough when you get to the end of games. Um, so it's it's hard. It's, it can be very draining. Um, but we're we're really happy with the response that we've been getting. Um, you know, when you guys were here first, we talked a little bit about the overhyping. So we were concerned about that, but. Um, we think these articles that you guys have been doing and the, and the interviews you came here and did with us um, have kind of really gotten out there what we want people to know about the game and, and what to expect. So that's that's been really nice. Yeah, like the reaction after the Game Awards, you know, really, you know, increased morale on the team. And then all this this uh, press attention has also done the same. But I think. You and I were just talking the other day that we both were trying to cut down on our coffee consumption, and apparently we picked the wrong time to do that. <laughs> Maybe next year. <laughs> it's so funny. Like it's always a recurring theme with developers. But like we liked what we saw of the game. We think it looks like it's in pretty good shape. But Absolutely. I love like the recurring theme for developers of always just like, we'll see how the landing goes. Like that last several months is just yeah. crucial. It yeah. could swing any wild direction. Our, produ- our producer just likes to comment that there's just so many moving parts and they all have to mesh together at the end. So individually, everything looks good. But now you're trying to mesh them all together. And it's uh, it's a little hectic. Yeah, no, I bet. I mean, uh, Hanson and I both both do lots of trips to come out and see studios. And it was really refreshing to be able to come and, and, and to your studio and and have each of you and the, and the rest of the team members that you work with offer such an honest and and frank look at this project that you guys have been pouring your heart and soul in into and they bought uh, it yeah <laughs> <laughs> i think it was you know it, it it's it's really nice to be able to have that kind of conversation i hope that uh some of these these users who've, who've had questions and and some of the other people who've read the content um that some of that has come across that that yeah. like uh that 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 kind of communication uh, about a game can be really valuable, and that I, I think that uh, communities out there can can detect when it's when it's genuine like that, and and that 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 can be a good way to communicate about games rather than having everything have to be wrapped in some sort of crazy marketing speak, some sort of rapid fire nonsense. <laughs> Just get to the facts. Yeah, uh, Tim and Leonard, uh, do you guys have anything else you want to say? No, just thank you guys for, for doing this. This has been great. Oh, yeah, and if there's any questions people have, attend PAX East in Boston and come by and ask us. Absolutely. Tell Tim how handsome he looks in person in Boston. <laughs> there it is. All right, thanks so much for your time, guys. Really appreciate it. All right, thank you, guys. Yeah, thank see you, you later. Hey, that's it. Thanks so much for tuning into the special edition of the Game Informer Show podcast. We hope you learned something. If you did... I would love it personally Yes. if you sent this to a friend. If you said, hey, there's a lot of answers in this podcast, damn it. It's cool that Game Informer opens up I, these developers to the community. I think there's some stuff in there that, like, if you were excited about The Outer Worlds, there's some stuff that we hadn't hit on, actually, yeah, during for sure. our coverage. So yeah. that's pretty cool. Absolutely. So thanks to everybody that uh, followed along with our coverage this month. Thanks to everybody that submitted a question at GameInformer.com. We really appreciate it. And thanks to anybody that is watching this, has subscribed to our YouTube channel, or subscribed to the audio version of The Game Informer Show. All right, uh, we'll be back next Thursday talking about Game Informer's next cover story in the next normal episode of the Game Informer Show podcast. Thanks for tuning in, everybody.